Okay, good afternoon. Uh, this is CIVE 632, Computational Hydraulics and Hydrology. Uh, today is uh, October 13, 2021. And today is the day or the day, uh, the day after or the day after the class, after the midterm. So I'm going to discuss the, the content of the midterm and answer what and, and tell you what was the right answer in my in my book, in my opinion. Um, so I have structured the exam in in essay questions, um, and uh, I pose twelve questions, and the students are supposed to answer only ten questions. To give you a little bit of latitude, you know, time. The, the hour is, or rather the, the duration of the exam is 75 minutes. But in this exam, because it's a, it is a virtual exam, I give you 15 minute leeway. So it, it makes it 90 minutes. Uh, the exam was, was or, or occurred uh, this Monday, October 11, and today we're reviewing it. So I am going to be stating the questions and then answering them. And I have to state all the questions. Let me see if I have all the questions here. Yeah, that's right, I do, okay. So the first question is, compare the celerity and attenuation properties of kinematic, diffusion, dynamic, and gravity waves. And I specify the Lagrange waves and state in tabular form. Um, I say Lagrange waves because uh, we know that there is a semantic confusion in the classification of waves. Because the original wave 200 years ago was Lagrange's, and he called it dynamic wave. Then came Lightheart and Guidham and did the kinematic waves, which is fine. And, and then the question that remained to be, to be established is whether what were the other waves, the third waves, uh, that means the mixed kinematic dynamic we're going to be called. And since uh, 1973, with the intervention of Danny Fred, we have been calling it dynamic. So there's a confusion as to what exactly is dynamic. Um, I can tell you that in the past 30 years, the prevalence has been to call the mixed kinematic dynamic wave the dynamic wave. So that leaves um, the Lagrange wave kind of out there, hanging without a name. Originally, when we did the paper in 1977, we called it gravity. We didn't like it, but we had no other choice. We weren't going to, you know, rock the boat at that time. So then that's what it is. So today I'm going to refer to, refer to kinematic, diffusion, dynamic of Fred, and then gravity waves of Lagrange. Okay? So, so what's the task in here? to state in tabular form, where let's, let's first talk about the kinematic waves. The kinematic waves are to the left of the spectrum of the dimensionless wave number spectrum. The celerity is the seven celerity, 1.5 of the velocity, chassis friction, and, and the attenuation is zero. In other words, kinematic waves don't have attenuation. They, they could ste steepen due to nonlinearity, but that's another story because our treatment here is not, not nonlinear. Okay, so that's the kinematic waves. The, the next in the spectrum, moving a little bit to the right of the dimensionless wave number spectrum, we, uh, we have the diffusion uh, uh, waves. Now the diffusion wave, we have shown that, it, that as an approximation, we could take the seven speed because they're close to the kinematic wave. As you can see from the shape of the S-curve, and uh, there, there is attenuation, that's why they're called diffusion. Then come the dynamic waves of Fred, the ones that go in the middle of the spectrum, those waves are subject to extremely high attenuation. As a matter of fact, the curvature of the wave reaches a, a second derivative equal to zero, and at that point, the peak of the attenuation is a maximum, you know that, and those peaks have a tendency to be very high 
particularly for the low fluid number of flows. And there's a whole lot of low fluid number of flows out there. Not the floods usually don't get to high numbers. Really don't get to high numbers. You have to have a very unusual situation, and we will study that later on. If and when the floods are going to get are going to be getting to exceeding fluid numbers equal to one and getting to fluid number equal to two, which is Vedernik of equal to one. So the dynamic waves are subject to high attenuation. Liget and Whittem said that they didn't think they existed. And that, that has been a, a point of contention. What are you, how are you going to calculate something that doesn't exist? Okay, so that's one thing. And then the gravity waves of Lagrange on the right side of the climatic spectrum, those waves have the Lagrange celerity, which is the square root of gy, where y is the depth, and they don't attenuate either. That uh, we found on the S-curve theory. Now, I'm going to say uh, clearly at this point that my contribution was to find the dimensionless wave number and put it all together. This, this stuff was all being known, but in pieces. And after we did the S-curve, it was not in pieces. It was in one place. So that's the answer for the first question. On the second question, uh, well, I'm going to try to spend the 75 minutes here, here but I, if I go fast, I probably would not use it. Okay, the second question is, what the overland flow and slow rising flood waves have in common that they lend themselves to description by kinematic and diffusion, and diffusion models? Let me first on... On the first question, many of you avoided the first question, by the way. The second question, uh, many of you failed in there. Okay. So the answer to that, I'm going to tell you exactly. The answer to that question is, it's, it's, this is kind of complicated, actually. This course is, is, is complex. Let me repeat, what the overland flow and slow rising flood waves have in common that they lend themselves to the description by kinematic waves. Okay. Wuheiser had determined in 1964, 65, that overland flow was, that, that kinematic waves were applicable to overland flow. At the same time, not at the same time, but much prior to that, um, Seddon had discovered the Seddon law, which is the celerity of kinematic waves. In the near year 1900. And in 1954, Leichhardt and Whittem put the theory together. So the kinematic waves, um, we know that there are also slow rising. It has to be slow rising. And the waves that are in lower Mississippi that uh, Sedum was working with, they are kinematic. Okay? So uh, because they're slow rising, they take a couple months to rise. Couple three months that makes it kinematic. All, all, all you know, it, it's just outright from experience. Okay, so so we have in here a, an interesting situation that when the scale is small, it applies. In the when the scale is large, it applies. So what does that mean? Does it mean that it applies everywhere? No, <laughs> no, it doesn't. Okay. So that means that there might be some, some trick out there that, the, that, that some, something that, that these two conditions have in common, okay? When we did the S-curve, our objective was precisely to determine what was the applicability of the kinematic and diffusion waves. Well, Heiser had already, already done the kinematic wave applicability for the overland flow, and I wanted to do it for the channel flow. And I also wanted to pursue the, the, the applicability of diffusion waves. So we did that. And we did that in that second paper that I have you read. And that paper says very clearly that there's a dimensionless number that for the applicability of kinematic and diffusion waves. And the dimensionless number, has, those two rules have, two thing, have one thing in common. The product of the TR, which is the time of rise, it depends. You can use TR, T, T, R, T sub R, time of rise of the flood wave, or you can use, also use the time base, the same thing. Because since this is sinusoidal waves, we assume that the time base is equal to twice the time of rise. 
Okay, so those two formulas that I'm referring to, that you will be able to find them in the, in the reading, have a product of T sub R times S sub R. There has to be something big to satisfy the condition. T sub R is the time of rise times S sub O is the slope. So it is clear then, then if the local situation has a large T sub R long enough, it will satisfy regardless of the slope and vice versa. Or in, 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 other, in other way, if you have a large slope, it will satisfy regardless of the T sub R. So it so happens in practice that the um, overland flow, many situations in overland flow have a large slope and it satisfies. In many situations in, in, um, in the low, lowland rivers have a large T sub R and they also satisfy. The, um, the T sub R in the Pantanal and the Paraguay River is six months. It goes up in six months and it comes back in six months, come down in six months because it follows the rotation of the earth every 12 months. Okay, so that's the answer to that second question. Uh, some of you said something else in there. Like I said, I'm looking for something. Uh, number three, what did Kunch do to advance the science of hydraulics and how did he do it? Well, Kunch realized, because he was a good n numbers guy, numeric guy, uh, he was a, I don't know if he has a degree in math, but he definitely has a degree in engineering. He wrote a book, actually, 1981, I believe. The book, the Kunch book is called Practical Aspects of Computational Hydraulics. Uh, Kunch, Holly, and Verwey. Holly was one of my classmates. He went out there to France and worked under Kunch or with Kunch for many years. And Verwey was a professor at, um, at a Dutch university. I don't know exactly which one, probably Delft. But um, so they wrote, wrote this book. It's a very good book. I have it in there. I don't check it too many times. I don't actually get engaged, at, at, at least at this time, in that kind of work. But um, he discovered he was playing around, because playing around is the thing. I played around for several years with this stuff. Uh, he was playing around with the numerical diffusion. And he realized that the Muskingum method diffused and then he also realized that the Muskinga method was is strictly derived from, from the kinematic wave equation. If you discretize the kinematic wave equation, you end up with the Muskinga Kunch equations. So then he asked himself, how come this wave is diffusing and it's not supposed to diffuse? And the answer is numerical diffusion. So he found that numerical diffusion was inherent to the Muskinga Kunch. I'm sorry, to the Muskinga the McCarthy Muskingum, 1938. So then he set out, and this is where the genius comes, he set out to figure out how to make sure that that calculation would be, would be, can be calculated, meaning can be reproduced and produce the grid independence, right? And he did that by uh, expanding the grid function it's a trick that he used. Uh, he and I have extensively talked about that in class. It's, uh, it's already contained in an appendix of my book because I believe that's a, that's a crucial formula and people should know where it comes from. Even though you may not actually have done the calculations to do it, miss, you know, spend a couple of hours and you could do it. Every, any, anybody that knows math could do it. En engineers are supposed to know math. Uh, so that then he did what her, he did in our field of hydraulics, or rather he did for the Muskingum, what, what uh, Hayami did in 1951. Hayami was able to express the numerical diffusion, no, I'm sorry, the physical diffusion. And Kanch was able to express the numerical diffusion. So that's what he did. How did he do it? Advanced the science of hydraulics. So he had, he expressed the numerical diffusion coefficient and was able to find the meaning of the x function. So no longer would you guess on the x, because prior to Kunch, 
we guessed on the X. There's books written on the subject in the 50s and the 60s that say, as far as X is concerned, try 0.2 or 0.3. This was, that's what the Linsley book said. But of course, that was not quite correct, and it was without the knowledge that Kanj gave us in 1969. Of course, the, the Linsley book dates back to the late 50s. Okay, number four. What are the differences between constant and variable parameter Muskingum Kanch routing? Number four. Yeah, a few of you answered, I mean, you answered, but you didn't answer completely. Okay, the constant parameter is linear. The variable parameter is nonlinear. That's one thing. The constant parameter will not steepen the hydrograph as it moves downstream. The hydrograph will keep its sinusoidal shape, approximate sinusoidal shape. As, as a matter of fact, I'm going to say that it kept its sinusoidal shape, not approximately, exactly. The variable parameter, though, will have a tendency to steepen if it's in bank or to flatten out if it's out of bank. Um, but at any rate, we said we change the shape. It would change the shape. And that's why we, that's where the where the killer wave originates. Uh, the kinematic wave becomes a, becomes a killer wave because it's in bank and it steepens. If you, if you were allowed to go out of bank, it, it would not steepen. Remember I told you the story about my experience in the Paraguay. When I asked uh, my colleague Benito, where was the steepening? He says, no steepening here. Why? Because the, 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 the waves go over bank very quickly all the time, as a matter of fact. So that's number two. Number three is, uh, it has been shown, we have shown that uh, constant parameter is 100% mass conservative, while the variable parameter conserves 1% or rather loses 1%, a very small amount. Because let's not forget that the 1% that we have calculated, it's in 500 miles. And nobody's gonna do a calculation of 500 miles. We were doing that because we want, we want clarity out of the answer. Okay, and uh, and then the number four, it's it's straighter, much easier to work with. It's much easier to work with. If you want to develop a, an Excel spreadsheet, the constant parameter, I'm not going to call it a piece of, piece of cake because some of you had trouble with it, but it is much r relatively compared to, in terms of difficulty, 10 times easier than the, than the nonlinear. Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay, so that's number four. Number five, how, how are we progressing here? I think we're going fast, so that's cool. What is the current number? What current number optimizes numerical diffusion and minimizes numerical dispersion in, in Muskingum routing? Everybody answered this question correctly. I must have drilled it several times. I love the current number. I do believe, I told you, that without knowledge and control and management of the current number, we can do nothing, absolutely nothing. And I think I, I've given you examples of that. Uh, so the current number is the ratio of physical celerity over numerical celerity. The numerical celerity defined as delta x over delta t. Delta x is the, the space, space step and the delta t is the time step. Why should it be that way? What is the importance of the Kurat number? And the answer is, there's a grid. You know there's a grid, there's a bunch of squares, okay? And the calculation needs to follow the characteristics, meaning the physics. The characteristics is a grid that follows the physics, follows the transport, the propagation. So if the Kurat number is equal to one, the the, the computation is going to shoot directly in the box from the left corner to the top right corner, left bottom corner to the top right corner. And it's going to find it very quickly. If the current number were, were 10, then it would have to go spread himself out in space and try to find it. And it's not going to work. It's not going to work because there's Taylor series problems in there. You know, the farther you go, the, the error of the Taylor series is larger and so forth. Anyway, that's that's in addition. But what we know is that that's the current number. That's how it's defined. And it's fundamental to any practice of hydraulic computations. 
um, hydraulic computations in open channels, free surface, uh, not in not in groundwater. It will get there eventually. In groundwater, there's another number. Interesting. Well, I'll get there. What current number optimizes numerical diffusion and minimizes numerical dispersion? Yes, we repeatedly ends or we repeatedly mentioned this that we have proven that current number one drops the dispersion. And since we are trying to calculate only this, this diffusion, we don't want any dispersion. So we drop the dispersion by making current number equal one. Interestingly and good for us, the current number is so well behaved that it will still work if the current number is close to one. So if you have 0 0.9 or 1.1 or 1.3, even 1.5, the current number will work. But if you get below 0.5, it will start messing up and if, by way of instability. In other words, as I've shown, those of you that solved the, well, you didn't, some of you didn't solve the problem number two. But those that did show, show to yourself that by the time the Quran number got to be 0 0.08, which is very low, you were getting the flow equal zero, which is negative. It cannot be. You, you cannot get below 50. So at that point, it was becoming unstable. Now, on the other hand, if you set the Quran number at 10 or 5, something on that order, you will not get instability. You, you will get uh, obliteration of the result. And you will get a lot of you get you will get what is called non-convergence, meaning if the answer is 10, 15, let's say answer the answer is going to be fifty, and you're getting twenty-five. It looks good, but it's wrong. Okay, so what is better in this case? Instability, which off right off the bat tells you it's wrong. Sorry, it's wrong. You made a mistake, or convergence. Obviously, better is instability because the instability, you know it's wrong. You can't give that to your boss or your client. While the convergence, if you're not aware of these things, you, you can miss it. You can say, oh, no, the answer, is, the answer is 25. But if you do the calculation right, the answer will be 50. So that's the issues of stability and convergence, which we would look theoretically in the next portion of the class. We also have a calculation, a theoretical calculation. I think it's coming up next week. Okay, what is grid independence in the context of numerical modeling? A couple, three people failed on this one. What is grid independence in the context of numerical modeling? Why is the Muskingum Kanch method grid independent while the kinematic wave and convex method are not? State the reason. Okay. What is grid independence in the context of numerical modeling? Every numerical modeling exercise has a grid. Okay, you as the engineer choose the delta T and the delta X. You have to. Some models allow you to choose the delta T, not the delta X, and then they choose the delta T. I'm not sure about how uh, uh, HMS does it in terms of of their methodologies because it's inner working. I don't have, I'm not a, I don't know it that, that because they don't publish their code, right? Uh, so we don't know what they did. They just did it and they published it. I, I'm talking about HMS, okay? So since they're grid independence, then the issue is, is the result not going to vary with the different size of grid? So in other words, if you have a 10, 10, 10 mile channel and you do a routing and one of you does one whack from one to 10 miles and you get an answer. And another person says, no, no, I don't think 10 miles is, I think it's too large. I'm gonna go two steps from zero to five. Um, yeah, I said one, but it's zero. From zero to five and then from five to 10. So he or she does it in two whacks, two steps, two time steps. If the method is grid dependent, the answer will be different. The answers at the cross section at 10, they will be different. And that's it. that's what happens with a straight kinematic wave of RAS, I'm sorry, HMS, and the convex method. 
the convex method also has that problem. So that's grid independence. Grid independence is the property of a numerical method to give the same result regardless of the grid specification. As far as we know, the Muskingum Kunch does that. Any other method that is invented in the future that will match in any, in some other equations, that will match numerical diffusion with physical diffusion, it's got to be grid independent. Okay? Um, and state the reason because the, the Muskingum Kunch has two parameters. It's based on the sudden speed and the high ambient diffusivity. And this is a two parameter problem. It's a two parameter by extension because, because the, the um, equation is, is first order. Technically, it should only have one parameter. But the error of the equation, and the equation has an error, it's a second order. So Kant proceeded to use that trick of finding the error and connect it to the, to the second order because you already knew the, the value of the Hayami diffusivity. So you see, so we're using two parameters. In Maskingam Kanch, we state the, set, the, the, the Hayami diffusivity, which we know, and the, uh, uh, the Kanch diffusivity, numerical diffusivity. And then we operate it. So that is why. While the kinematic waves, any of the kinematic waves, the Lee kinematic wave doesn't have that. The, the HMS, which is really an MIT kinematic wave, 1973, uh, don't have that. You cannot have diffusion in a method and not have a way of calculating, calculating it, because then it's going to give you grid dependence. OK, number seven. What is the cause of attenuation and unsteady open channel flow? Number seven, many of you missed. I think it may have been because the, the, the question was not clear. I thought it was clear, but I guess it wasn't. And, and I have to refer back to my experience with Dave Basco back in the late 70s, I believe. Or was it the late 80s? Maybe. I don't remember now. But I know I had a meeting with Dave Basco, and he gave a presentation. And he's an numeric guy. He's, a, he's an numerical hydraulics guy. He's a professor out there somewhere in the East Coast, I think in... I think it's North Carolina somewhere, or South Carolina, I'm sorry, South Carolina. And he stated at a meeting that friction is the cause of, of attenuation. So I pulled him over at the end of the, uh, he's a good friend of mine, so I don't want to uh, embarrass him. So I, I, I pulled him over and I said, Dave, um, if friction is, a, is the cause of the attenuation, how come the kinematic waves that are constituted by friction, 50% of it, do not attenuate? And he looked at me, he realized that I had put him in a box and he said, we got to study this, Ponce, we got to study this a little bit more. And that is correct. That was, I believe that was the end of 78, because then I came back and wrote that paper in 81. When I was here at San Diego State, looking for topics to write, I wrote this paper. Unfortunately, it's a highly mathematical paper, but it had to be done that way if you want to find the truth. So we did find the truth using the tracking digits, the zero and one. Zero if you don't use it, one if you use it. And we found out, and that's the end of that particular paper that I, have you, I had you read, that the interaction with friction and the local term, local acceleration term, is the primary cause of it. We would say, well, that's what causes it, fundamentally. But if there is no uh, local acceleration, because sometimes the local acceleration is very, very small, uh, there's two other terms in there. There's convective acceleration and the uh, pressure gradient. As a matter of fact, in a sinusoidal wave, if there's local, there's convective, so you can really difficult to say only local doesn't exist, only convective doesn't exist. They both exist at different magnitudes, kind of small, but, but, but different, okay? 
But the point is that if you wanted to neglect both of them because they are small anyway, then you end up with a diffusion wave. And then the, att the attenuation is caused by the interaction of the kinematic, kinematic terms with the pressure gradient. That's what we said in our paper. Number eight, what is kinematic shock? The kinematic shock occurs when a kinematic wave is allowed uh, by artificiality of the model or in reality in physics in the real world to steep into the point where it becomes almost a wall of water. I say almost, it's not quite a wall of water, but it, is, it, will be, it could be called depending on where you look at it. If you look at it from in the front, by perspective, it'll be a wall of water. Okay. If you're on top flying of it, flying over it, it may not be a wall of water, but it doesn't matter. It's still killed. It killed several people in 1982, I believe it was in the Tanque Verde Creek. I believe if I'm correct, based on the work that uh, Jamerson did, there were eight people killed. What actually happens is that in a dry area, and the dry area happens in the Western United States, but it could also happen uh, in the in the in the regions in the Midwest or like the Ozarks, you know, out there, uh, because they have kind of a, a weather that is not wet, it's not dry, it's kind of in the middle. It has to be because it's transitional to the West, right? It's like Texas. East Texas is extremely wet and West Texas is extremely dry. As a matter of fact, I did say that the 800 millimeter go, runs through San Antonio. I think I did say that. So, so the kinematic shock, we already know. It's a kinematic shock of any kind that is allowed or has uh, steepened to the point where it becomes a wall of water. Now, how do you steepen? Well, you allow it to progress it because it has to take its time. So a kinematic wave may not, may not end up being a, a kinematic shock if it doesn't have the time and or the space, okay? Under what, and under what four physical conditions is a kinematic shock more likely to develop? Okay, this is interesting. This is something that fascinated me at the beginning of the 1980s. And then I, I, wrote, I worked on and wrote that paper with uh, uh, Diane Windingland. And I asked Diane, I said, I have this model, which is uh, Muskegon Gunch, and it's nonlinear. So it will steepen. So you run it 100 times, 200 times, whatever it is, of course, intelligently. You're not going to just run it. You have, you, I, I will help you choose which cases. You cannot cho choose an infinite number of cases, but I say you got at least 100. 1,000 is too big, 100 is enough. 100, I think she raw, run, ran about 150 cases of different kinds, different base flow, different this, different that, different cross sections, and so on and so forth. Um, I was looking at mostly at base flow and cross sections. And, uh, and I was not looking at the fruit number. But when we actually came up with all the answers, it turned out that the fruit number was there. And I realized that that was correct. Because we all know that if the fruit number gets to be really high, it doesn't happen very often. It only happens in constructed channels. But if it does have to be very high, then uh, then you have steepening steepening of the wave. You may not have a kinematic shock, but would have a, you would have a steepening of the wave, which is the same thing. It's different manifestations of the same thing. Okay, and there what four physical conditions? Okay, uh, the first condition is a high fruit number. The second condition is the cross section. It has to be rectangular. Okay. The uh, the third condition. Let me see this. Four physical conditions, right? I'm drawing a blank here. Uh, so it's the cross section, the base flow, the fruit number, and uh, I'm drawing a blank here. I forgot. Let's check it out. Let's check it out. We have the stuff in here. That would be under 
under the uh, over here, right, right, exactly. So it's the fruit number because that if the fruit number gets to be very high, it could become dangerous, right? The oh yeah. I forgot, how did I forget? The wave has to be kinematic. You cannot have a diffusion wave developing a shock because the diffusion is gonna fight the shock. And typically the diffusion is gonna win because diffusion is easy. The, the shock, the development of the shock has to happen in time and on space. And you generally don't have that kind of stuff. That's why these things are unusual. They don't happen all the time because you have to have time and space in order to get it. And if you don't have time and space, then you're, you're done. You don't get it. Okay, so that's basically it. What is the kinematic shock and what is, what is the killer wave? The killer wave is the wave that kills. And it has happened many times. I would say several, I mean, one could research it several times. These are, the, these are so-called flash floods in the, in the public literature. So occurrence of flash floods that have killed people. One could Google that and see how many, but I happen to know that they're relatively common in the central United States and the Western United States. Why? Because they have zero base flow. And base flow is one of the conditions. Remember, if you have zero base flow, you have a high fruit number. If you have a cross section that's prevalent or conducive, right? And if you have a kinematic wave outright from the beginning, you're gonna get it, provided you have enough time and space. Number nine. We're doing well with the time, John, or ladies and gentlemen. How do the Hayami Dugan Pons hydraulic diffusivities differ from each other? Uh, let, that's number nine. Number nine. There's one of one of you missed this. Well, the Hayami is Q sub naught over two S sub O, which says that the, the, the numerical diffusivity is directly proportional to the discharge per unit of width and inversely proportional to the slope. That means higher slope, less diffusivity. It means stronger flow, more diffusivity. That's a fact. Uh, if the slope is zero, like in a plane, the, the, the water doesn't have any, any gravity to push it, and therefore just hangs around, it stays around. Diffusivity tremendous, right? Infinite, infinite as a matter of fact. For slope zero, diffusivity is infinite. Well, what is the diffusivity of a lake? Infinite. The, the water's not going anywhere, it's standing on the lake because the, the technical slope of a rate, or the flow slope, or rather the fluid slope of a lake is zero. It's the water surface slope because there is no slope that is moving the flow at the bottom. Doug in the year, we don't know exact year, but he published it, as far as we know, in 1973. Although he had been publishing earlier for about 20 years, and he must have published this report somewhere else in a journal that we have not consulted. Uh, so Doug said, not quite the Hayami diffusivity. If we use the inertial, the inertia terms that he disregarded, and we use the right math tool, which he used the uh, linear analysis, linear system, and he ended up with the fact that that Q sub naught over 2S sub zero needed to be multiplied by one minus F squared over four. One minus F squared over four. That was the formula he gave, 19, let's say 1973. Okay, that was 1973. Uh, then there were some gentlemen from Poland that liked um, go, uh, Doug and went to work with him in um, Dublin. Uh, I don't, I can't pronounce their names, but it's written in the literature. And they published a paper in the year 1982 that I came across. And I saw it and I said, Oh my God. And I saw the answer. And the answer 
can be tracked to the beta. The beta, the exponent of the rating, was in the answer. And it turned out that the F squared over 4 was, in fact, the Jesse friction in Y channel expression for the beta. You know that. I've already talked about that. So then I said, oh, it's the beta in here. They didn't say it. Well, actually, they did, because they weren't using beta. They were using M, I believe. They were saying they came up with the expression. Okay. So they clarified the do a little better, uh, come on a kind of a, a step further. Okay, that was in 19, what did I say? 1982, I believe, right? Yeah, 82, 73, 82, 82, that's right. And then uh, over the last, uh, last part of that decade, I was working on the Rodernikov number, and I realized that that expression was indeed the Rodernikov number because I know the Rodernikov number, what it is. And as a matter of fact, in the year 1991, I wrote two papers, the perspective on the Rodernikov number, and uh, the other one I feel is, I think it's called the kinematic wave controversy. Both two were very well accepted papers where we spelled out the one minus V square because it was there in no uncertain terms. So, um, that's where the that's the history of the evolution of this concept. We still have to figure out how important it is that one minus v squared, because it turns out that for the watershed cases, uh, the flows are so small, then the fruit number is also small. Therefore, the Veternica number is small, and the, the difference may be too small, too small to even consider. But I'm convinced that if we charge that model with more flow, it will happen. It'll, it'll start to show, it has to start to show, because the one minus V square is there in the formula. That is a job that I think uh, Andrea is going to be researching for the next six weeks. What are the two dimensionless parameters describing convection, division, and dispersion in a dimensionless treatment of flyway propagation? Okay. People have done routing with one parameter. That's in HMS. And that's HMS, routing with one parameter. Um, other people have done routing with two parameters. That's Maskingan, Maskingan Kanj, right? But until Ferric came about in the year 1984, we really, the profession hadn't really done heavily into heavily, I say heavily, because Duke had already done it. Duke even did three and four, third order and fourth order. But uh, Ferry came out and very clearly expressed uh, the, uh, uh, the governing equation. If there's one governing equation, you can take the two governing equations, continuity and mass, and combine them in a proper in the proper way and get one governing equation. And that governing equation, um, Farig was able to get the third order. He got it in a complex way, and then eventually he he simplified it by more algebra, and he got the third order equation. So when I saw the third order equation that Farig had put together, I realized that he had not finished the job. Remember I told you, good researcher never finished a job. So Professor Pons then, huh, this guy is a great guy. I met him. I, met, I was there. Froze to death one February. I believe the year, I can't remember the year. But uh, he was a great guy, but he had not finished the job. And he didn't finish the job because he did not know the trick to non-dimensionalize. But I knew. So then I said, I bet if this equation that he has put together can be used in terms of El Sabo, it'll it'll pop itself, it'll clear itself completely. And it did. I worked at it for a while, you know, it takes a few days to do this kind of stuff. Remember, this is the first time. And it turned out that once we put the L sub O, which he had not used, he used the L, not the L sub O. The L is the length, absolute length, and the L sub O is the relative to the friction. D sub O over S sub O is equal to L sub O. We know that very clearly. 
So when I was able to do that, it popped the equation in dimensionless form that, that um, he had tried to do, and it identified, it said that the coefficients, the dimensionless coefficients, were only a function of two parameters, the Fru de Vedernico. That was in 1991. So then that we realized that we had hit on something big. That means the fruit can never be mentioned alone. It has to be mentioned together with the Vedernico. Fruit without Vedernico is like saying half of the story. So that's, of course, our quest. It is a quest to try to get the Vedernico recognized. It should be recognized. People shouldn't talk about the fruit without talking about the Vedernico. They are the same. Whether we like it or not, I mean, names, whatever it is, but the Vedernico is, sit, sits right next to fruit, fruit. As a matter of fact, the ratio between Vedernico and fruit is the beta. So really, the beta subsums the entire theory of unsteady open channel hydraulics. I said that in class, those of you that took uh, open channels with me last year. What is runoff diffusion? How does it differ from, from reservoirs, channels, and watersheds? Okay, the word runoff existed. Runoff is water flowing on the surface. And diffusion is spreading of the flow in time and no space. We, I believe, I'm correct in that. We're the first ones to kind of put it in a phrase, runoff diffusion. And we did it in our book because we felt that our book was mainly or focused on the calculation of runoff diffusion. Not just diffusion, because what is diffusion? Diffusion is, is a property of nature that has a tendency to kill everything, obliterate it eventually. Why? Because if perturbations happen and too many perturbations, life could be threatened. So then nature came in there and says, no, if any of these perturbations happens, we're gonna to try to diffuse it. And, and this the, the, the perturbation applies everywhere. It applies in physics, it applies in chemistry. I'm not going to get into biology, but it does apply. It's a general law of nature, diffusion. So diffusion doesn't tell the story. It just tells the broad story. But Rano diffusion is different. Rano diffusion is what we have done for 40 years. Okay, so here, Rano diffusion. How does it differ from reservoir channels and watersheds? Okay, that's an interesting question because there's three, I'm not gonna call it aspects, I'm gonna call it entities. There's a reservoir, a zero slope, constraint, a dam. That's one thing. Channel, finite slope. So a channel is not a reservoir, and a reservoir is not a channel, okay? Because the reservoir has zero slope because the, you can't calculate the bottom slope. You have to, based on the surface slope. While the channel has a finite slope, it has to have a finite slope. Otherwise, it becomes a flat channel, therefore a reservoir. Do flat channels exist? And the answer is yes, of course. Everything exists. In Florida, um, when uh, South Florida Water Management District went, in, went into South Florida with the intent to manage it, I think it was late 40s, early 50s, they decided to become the, the controllers of the flow of the water of the Everglades. Now, uh, there's a couple of rivers that flow into the Okeechobee Lake in central Florida, south of Orlando. And then naturally, the Lake Okeechobee would outflow into the Everglades, which eventually run south into the key, the Florida Keys. Okay, so we went in there, meaning society, US, Florida, Army Corps of Engineers. We went in there in the 90, 50, 40s, 50s, 60s and managed it. And we basically told Lake Okeechobee, you're gonna do what we say. We're gonna enclose you, we're gonna get the channels out. And they got a whole bunch of channels out there. They numbered them, they didn't give them names. And there's a few channels, I don't know how many, but I've been on top of them. There's a few channels that are flat, zero flow. The flat channels. If you don't pump any water, it just sit like a lake, a linear lake. But but it's not the channels were made for transport. 
only that in these particular channels, the transfer was supposed to go right and then left. Whenever they wanted, they could switch the flow and go left or right. They wanted to manage it, right? And they did. So they set up a couple of pumping stations, one on, on the left side, or uh, uh, there's no upstream here. One on the left side, one on the, I guess you could say, western side, eastern side. And these channels are, I would say, three or four miles. I'm not, don't get me on that number. But I've seen, I've been in one pump and saw the other one because Florida is very flat. You can see it at the end. We have pictures of that even. So, uh, so there are zero, zero slope, zero slope channels. In watersheds, the watersheds are not channels. The watersheds are not reservoirs. The watersheds are watersheds, <laughs> repetitious. It's a place where water drains from upstream to downstream, from what we call the upland to the mouth. The mouth of the watershed is the end where every, every water collects. And I know many of you are familiar with this because you're used to practicing hydrology and that's okay. Hydrologists are very familiar with watersheds. There's umpteen watersheds around the world. And one watershed combined with another would lead to a third watershed and it could be called something else. It's, a, it's an infinite number, or not infinite, but a very, very large number of watersheds. I would say in the millions, okay? So then the, the flow in the watershed is different because it's a flow controlled by friction. It's really largely controlled by friction. It is also a flow that has a tendency to be transitional, not quite laminar, not quite turbulent. It's not quite turbulent. And that's why Horton, in his study of watersheds in the middle 30s in the US, came up with the value of beta equal to two. He says, my data tells me that I should be using two, not three or 1.5. 1.5 would have been turbulent and three would be laminar. And he told us or showed us that indeed there is such a thing as mixed laminar turbulent flow, which is not the same as transitional. The transition is in a pipe where if you have Reynolds number 500, you got laminar flow. And if you have Reynolds number 2000, you got turbulent flow. It's transitional flow, that's steady flow in a pipe. Here we're talking unsteady flow, not a pipe, in a watershed. In that case, we refer to as mixed laminar turbulent flow. So those are the three. Now, how does it differ? In reservoirs, the reservoirs always produce diffusion. If the reservoir does not produce diffusion, it's not a reservoir. Remember in, uh, in the SAR method, the C controls the diffusion. If the C is greater than two, it blows up. Because you look at C. C basically says that C is delta T over K. So, so for C to be greater than two, delta T has to be greater than K, which means there's no, there's, the storage is, is, is longer. I'm sorry, shorter. The storage is shorter. Whatever, I got confused there. But the point is with a C much greater than two, it would not work. Absolutely would not work. We tried it many times, okay? Uh, so there's this kind of the same reason why the Muskinga method does not work for X greater than 0.5, by the way. And McCarthy discovered that very early in the game. Okay, so for C, greater than two, it would not work. So always reservoirs diffuse. The channels, the propagation of waves in channels was, was clarified by our S curve paper. The channel may diffuse or may not diffuse. If it's kinematic, it won't diffuse. If it's Lagrangian gravity, so, so to speak, it will not diffuse. If it's mixed kinematic dynamic or the dynamic Fred wave, it will diffuse. Of course, we know now that there are not that many waves that are diffuse a lot because if they diffuse a lot, that they wouldn't be there. Okay, but the point is that the channels will diffuse depending on the dimensionless wave number. The watersheds. The watersheds is the new one. <laughs> this is really amazing. It's the new one because it has come up only recently. Um, I, uh, there's a there's a story on that, but I'm not going to get into it. Uh, but we did a calculation in the year 1999 with uh, Amy Club Bundy. And I said to Amy, Amy was a student of ours, grad student. 
I said to Amy, you want to do a project? I think she did a project. She didn't do a thesis. She was going to do a project. I've got this model, which is a diffusion wave model of catchment dynamics. So it'll calculate the diffusion in a catchment. So I want you to run it many times. Like I said, 100 times or whatever. However, no, actually she ran it. I don't remember how many times, but he did a, a lot of run. I know, he spent three months, four months on a complete project. And uh, I said, give me what's going on. You know, how, what are the answers? Or what makes the answers tick? What, it, what, what are the cause effects in the answer? Okay, we found out that, the, um, that in the watersheds, if it rains indefinitely, it will not diffuse. Okay, if it rains, there's, there's a tricky situation in here, by the way, it's not easy because there's so, so many things at, in the same place, okay? But you have a time of concentration related to the size of the watershed and you have the, the length of the rain. So if, a, if the time of concentration is short, which is for small basins, the stuff will not diffuse. It will reach a peak, the QI, the rational method, and, and that's it. So you can't call that diffusion. But if you had a long watershed where it stops raining in the middle of the flow, that the flow is coming out from headwaters to mouth, then it will, it will look like it's going up to the peak and all of a sudden it got cut short and then it diffuses and it spreads out. And spreading out is diffusion. So if it did spread out, it did diffuse. So then we say that for the watersheds, it depends on the relationship within the rain. See, see how interesting this thing? In the channel, there's no rain. In the reservoir, there's no rain. It's input output from upstream to downstream. But in the watershed, the input is up, it is, is up high, the rain coming up from the, from the air, from the sky. And therefore, that is the difference. It's a geometric but uh, substantial difference in behavior. We also did say in our paper that for the time of concentration to get really long, the slope has to be the slope of the watershed has to be getting down. It has to be getting, so like in the Paraguay and places like that, when the slope is 0 0.0001, the time of concentration is going to be long, and therefore you're going to have diffusion because the diffusion is caused because the time of concentration extends itself, and therefore it causes diffusion because the rain stops, right? So that that's the answer to that question. Reservoirs, no diffusion. Channels diffusion dependent on the on the uh, dimensionless wave number. In the watersheds, depending on the relationship between the time of concentration and the rainfall duration. That's what I wanted you to say. How did Ponce improve Ferris conversion diffusion equation? That that was a gift because it was I already asked that question. Well, he improved Ferris conversion diffusion equation by expressing the the celerity, dimensionless convection, dimensionless diffusion, dimensionless version is a, is a function of only two numbers. The only two numbers. When it comes down to flow in open channels, there is only two numbers. Well, yeah, that's not quite right, but let's just say the two numbers. There are, as you know from reading my book, chapter one, there's actually four numbers in open channels. The fruit of Vedernico that we have already identified, which is a ratio of celerities, ratios, three celerities, two fruit numbers. I mean, two numbers, two dimensionless numbers. And then there is also a ratio of diffusivities. It should be because diffusivity is second order and is always considered. And the ratio of diffusivities, one ratio of diffusivity gives us, gives us to the Reynolds numbers, which we already know from steady flow, but now in unsteady flow. The problem is that the Reynolds number is ill-defined. I no, no disrespect to Mr. Reynolds, who lived 200 years ago. You can Google him. Osborne Reynolds is his name. Find out where he, when he lived. A couple 200 years. Dr uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, English, I believe. Uh, his, his Reynolds number is, is, is I don't know. I, um, read my book. It's there, okay? So Reynolds number, 
So we would have to come up, come up with a kind of a slightly different Reynolds number, but still a ratio of diffusive radius, which is what he did in the first place. And that's, that's for the Reynolds number, right? And, and in addition to the Reynolds number, we have another ratio because of, because there's also three diffusivities. So there's two numbers, and the other number is the dimension is wave number. It's our dimension is wave number. That is the fact. Okay, so with that, I am going to um, finish in here. We, we are short, I mean, not short, we have ample time. If there's any questions, this would be the time to try to answer the questions. Otherwise, we just got it short. And I, I, like I repeat, if you want to review your exam, set up a slot with me. I have one with one of you tonight. It could be either tonight or tomorrow or any, any slot. Okay? Thank you. I see you're very quiet. Danny? No comments. <laughs> no questions. <laughs> that was a very thorough overview. <laughs> Thank Take you. it all in. Thank you. I know I do. Uh, I do understand. That's the word. Understand that this stuff is tough. The material is tough. This stuff for anybody that is looking at it for the first time. I mean, I've looked at it hundreds times of times, but it's for me it's easy. Uh, I'm getting older and I can't speak as smoothly as I did when I was 30, but still. Uh, but you guys, it's a hard, it's a hard course. What can I say? Okay. Thank you. So we'll see you then uh, when? Monday. Right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Monday. Thank like you. Said, at any time, just get get in touch with me and let's schedule a slot for, for to, if there's any clarification, individual clarification needed. Okay? Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm.